<laughs> All right. Well, now uh, in the break, we're going to take a look at uh, something last night from Comedy Central. Made a little fun of the uh, Murkowski race. Trouble for two-term Senator Lisa Murkowski, originally appointed to the Senate by former Alaska Governor Frank Murkowski. I, wait a minute! Murkowski, Murkowski! <laughs> I'm sure that's just a common Alaska name. <laughs> anyway, Senator Thanks Dad appears to have been beaten by a candidate with little money and no real political connections save a Sarah Palin endorsement. I mean, who the hell is Joe Miller? I'm Joe Miller, the true conservative choice for the U.S. Senate in Alaska. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I... Actually, he's obviously the son of the other Alaska dynasty, the Brawnies. They do resemble each other, don't they, a little bit there? Yes, and as we know, however, there, it is very rare for someone to get elected to the United States Senate with facial hair. This would be the first time in a long time. In fact, maybe that will be our trivia question a for tomorrow. To and certainly Not the today. Oval Office. It's been a long time since we've had one of those there, too. That's and, for and sure. Beard and president. But right now we want to welcome Ann Cornblood of the Washington Post, a White House correspondent for our post-politics section. And, uh, Ann, we want to lead off uh, by uh, asking you about uh, the president's speech last night. Yeah, before we do that, let's take, let's take a look at a clip from that speech. I'm mindful that the Iraq war has been a contentious issue at home. Here, too, it's time to turn the page. All right, Ann. So... Doesn't seem like the page has been turned, or has it? Well, he's tried to. Um, he packed a lot into the speech, which right. was um, you know, about 15 minutes, a little more than 15 minutes. Um, he, he really has wanted to, for some time, change the subject. He promised, obviously, as a candidate to end the Iraq war. Um, they've started down the path of doing that by taking out all of the combat troops. Um, obviously, he didn't declare a mission accomplished, um, as President Bush did in 2003. But he did want to say, this is the end of it. But by the time he got to the speech, they also had to talk about some other things the White House did, um, Afghanistan being one one, the economy being the other. And so he really put a lot into the speech altogether. I'm not sure if it was too much or if he was telling a um, cohesive story, which I think was their goal. And one of the, the main themes of the speech, and the White House was tweeting it afterwards, was, was this promise kept. Um, do you, do you, did you see that? Is, is the base going to see this as a promise kept? I mean, that's really who he was speaking to on that point, right? Well, that's right. And that's the reason for the great emphasis on this. He could have done something much smaller. He could have just gone to Fort Bliss like he did yesterday, shook some hands, said, look, we've reached a milestone, and let that be the end of it. By having his only his second Oval Office address, he was drawing a lot of attention to it, sending Vice President Biden to Iraq. So hoping to send that signal that, unlike the other great accomplishment, uh, health care, that perhaps this one will be more popular with the population at large. But they have to hope now that things don't go terribly wrong in Iraq, that, that a government is formed, that there isn't an outbreak of violence that kills a lot more American so soldiers, and that next year when the time comes to bring all the troops home, that things are going well enough for that actually to happen, that, th that the Iraqi government doesn't request an extension, because that would almost certainly, going into a presidential election year, undo whatever promise was kept at this point. And it could look an awful lot like a mission accomplished moment in retrospect if, if that happens, but we hope it doesn't. Um, well, and, and then looking to today, the president, of course, spending time on Middle East peace. A lot of Democrats up for re-election in 2010 are wondering when we're going to start seeing him do more focus on the issue that they're hearing about, which is the economy. Which is the economy, which is, right. again, why you heard him bring it up in the speech last night, even though it might have seemed like kind of a sharp pivot. Um, look, he said as a candidate he was going to get to the Middle East sooner than previous presidents had and really make this a priority. And if this works, it's not going to happen today or tomorrow when right. they're all in town. But if it eventually works, that would be a huge, enormous um, accomplishment that I think would actually help him with the electorate. A lot of people want this to work. But you're right. Uh, heading into Labor Day, this is why he's going to go to uh, Wisconsin on Monday for Labor Day. They've, they're going to figure out some other ways to talk about the economy, but they're hamstrung. What are they going to say? We want it to be better. They don't have uh, anything that they can really, apart from a small business bill that may or may not pass, there's not a whole lot on, it, there are not, not a lot of arrows in their quiver at this point for them to use. And so it's really just sort of talking about it, and that's a tough place to be. Is this a messaging problem for them? They would argue it's a substance problem. Uh, but sure, it's a messaging problem. If you don't have anything substantively you can do, then the message has to improve. But this has been the, the, pro the problem they've had for quite some time. So again, how, how will he connect? This is a question we've been asking for two years. All right. Well, Ann Kornblatt, thank, so thank you so for much for joining us. us. This is wonderful. We will see you all next time on Top Line. Have a good day, guys.